Today we're in South Florida for another episode of Talking Watches. We're speaking with a legendary Hall of Fame golfer who has leveraged his personal brand to create a number of highly successful businesses, ranging from winemaking to golf course design to apparel. He's also a watch collector. His name is Greg Norman, and today we're talking watches. Greg Norman, thank you so much for joining us for an episode of Talking Watches. You're an all-time great golfer, Hall of Famer, and a serial entrepreneur. But what some people might not know is that you were one of the first pro golfers of the modern era to wear a watch on the course. That's um, correct. And it started with this Ebel. Can you tell me a little bit about this guy? Yeah, it was. It's an interesting story because Ebel came to me, obviously I was the number one player in the world at the time, and they came to me for an endorsement deal. And they said, hey, would you be interested in wearing a watch on the golf course? Mm -hmm. Obviously great advertising, right? Right. And I thought about it for uh, long and hard. We did sign the contract, obviously. And I did a lot of testing with it, some with metal band on it, some with the leather band on it, some with different color face on it. And I ended up with this one for a couple of reasons. And I wore this on my right wrist, just like today I wear this watch on my right wrist. The reason why it came with this face is it doesn't reflect as much right. because when I played, most of my tee times on the weekend were in the afternoon, fortunately because I was playing well, and that afternoon sun at a certain angle, it would be reflecting on the face on my left hand, and as I took my putter back and forth, you'd see this reflection going back and forth on the green, a little bit distracting. So I decided to switch over to the dark face and then switch over to my right hand. The other thing that was interesting about the, the testing of watches, when I had a metal band on my left wrist, when I got to the top of my swing and I started coming on my downswing, that extra weight created a little bit of a different proprioception in my arm and it was just a slight adjustment of impact. So I switched it to the right hand, lightweight watch, and I wore that watch you're holding there, I won the British Open with. So then after eBell, you ended up signing a deal with Rolex. Mm -hmm. And we have some really cool gold Rolexes here. The one that really jumps out at me though is this GMT Master right. on a Jubilee bracelet, which still has the tag. Yep, exactly. Which means it's probably never been worn really. It's never been worn. I do remember that was one of the last watches that Rolex gave me. So it's unique having a watch like that that's never been worn. But at the same time, I'm a big believer of a man's only accessory that he can wear is either cufflinks or a watch. So I think it's pretty cool because when I do get dressed up, I do wear the watch that matches the attire or matches the social scene you're going to. Like here, the, you know, the Submariner watch. You know, yeah. I wore that a lot on, on the boat when I used to have a boat because yeah. I thought it was appropriate being a Submariner. So I even dive with it a little bit until a couple of times um, Barracudas like to come around very shiny objects. Bit of an attraction to certain fish. And then of course you have another Submariner, the Hulk. That was given to me by my best friend in Australia on my birthday. That's the beauty about accessories or watches. People know if you're going to get a gift and you're lucky enough to, these watches obviously have some value to them. So when you have a gift given to you like that, you know that people have thought about it because they know they've seen me wear many other watches of many different styles. So they know, okay, I know Greg likes his style. Like I said, it's a balance for me about how I like to look and how I like to present myself. If I'm going into a high power meeting with a red tie on, I may wear this dress watch, right? Well, 5035. This is the first annual calendar ever made. I think it was from 1996, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken. Just such a cool watch. I mean, for like the boardroom, this is the, boardroom, this yeah. is the place to go. Exactly and then, of right. course, you had a quite famous partnership with Omega mm -hmm. for a number of years. And from that, you have a few watches this is a cool watch with yeah. a lot of stories, so maybe we can start with this uh, Aquaterra. Yeah, the Aquaterra was when I was the you know, captain of the uh, International President's Cup team down in Royal Melbourne in Australia in 2011. We talked to them about maybe a good present to my team and mm -hmm. say thank you for being on the team was giving them a, an Omega watch. And that's the one I decided on. Again, it's different because it's the size of it. It does stand out. And um, when I gave it to all the 12 players on my team, they were, they were very, very impressed. And then, of course, we have also over here these Seamasters. Yeah, they, these are like day-to-day -day watches, you know, yeah. that you can wear anywhere. You can, you can beat them up pretty good, actually. When I go to my ranch in Colorado, watches like this I'll wear all the time because, you know, like I say, they're bulletproof. And, you know, when you're out in the mountains hiking, you've got no phone reception. You want to be able to know what's going on with time. And this one, like you mentioned, is a full ceramic case. Mm -hmm. 
and the gold one has ceramic inlaid on the bezel and uh, Sierra Gold numerals, which I think Omega came out with this a couple of years ago. Yeah, they did. And look, Omega's been a great partner to golf. When I was with them, we saw an opportunity for them to get involved with the PGA Championship. So when the door was open to that, Omega took a look. They fell in love with the exposure that they would get through this one major championship of the world. And now here we are, Omega has their tournament in Switzerland. They're also more involved with golf now than they've ever been. So I was proud to be a little bit of history in that or part of that because there's nothing more fulfilling for me than you know giving back to the game of golf and introducing corporations to our great game. And then of course, two other watches that I noticed from among your collection are both Gerald Genta designs, but they look radically different. We'll start with the one that the audience probably knows the best, right. the AP Royal Oak. Can you tell me about how you got this gold Royal Oak? I can indeed. Um, it was in the 80, probably 86, 87. I went to Brunei to do an exhibition match there. The Sultan of Brunei uh, had a 18 hole lit golf course because uh -huh. it's so hot there, you play golf at nighttime. So he flew four of us in and we did this exhibition match and that was a gift that he handed on to, to us for coming to play. So a lot of history, a lot of great memories there because he wasn't a golfer, but he did appreciate golf. And to, to be able to, again, be the catalyst of taking the game into other countries, like in Brunei or like in China, I was the first person to do uh, an exhibition match in mainland China. One of the first golfers to go into Dubai when the Hard Rock Cafe was the tallest building in Dubai. And you, know, you forget about it, right? Yeah. 20 years go by, 25 years go, go by, you forget about it. But when I was getting ready to do this interview, it was amazing how every watch has a story yeah. to some degree and it actually it's embedded in your mind and you never really forget it because it is a significant part of your history. And then another uh, Genta design is this Cartier. This is the Pasha de Cartier Perpetual Calendar. This one you bought for yourself? I did. I bought that for myself. That was, I bought in Dubai, believe it or not. I get attracted by the physicality of a watch, I guess, and the ease of wearing it. I appreciate mechanisms. I appreciate the look of a watch. Like I said, I think a good watch is sexy and it's physicality, but a good watch is also sexy in the makeup that you don't have to worry about the, the internals of anything, right? It's got a lot of great engineering behind it, so when you put it on your wrist, you feel like you're putting on something very, very classy. You know, when you look back at your playing career, obviously there's some highlights that we all know about, the two Open Championships. Are there any other moments that really stick with you as uh, important times for you uh, in your playing time? Well, how about that one right at it? I was very fortunate. I never, I was as an assistant pro making $28 a week to turning pro, winning my first golf tournament to the next 20 years of time, I never anticipated that. I enjoyed every step of the way. I just wanted to be the best I could be, just improve, 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 improve. And I was a self-taught guy. So an incredible rewarding journey. How did you start playing? How did you get into the game? I was kind of bored one day yeah. when down in Brisbane and I was about going on my 16th birthday and I went out and caddy for my mother and my mother at that time was a really good player. She was a three handicapper and, and when she went in for a, a cup of tea with her friends, her playing partners, I took her golf clubs out and it was like out, back, out and back. Four holes, got hooked, you know. Yeah. I figured if my mother who's, you know, five foot three, 100 pound ringing wet, yeah. I could play the game that I could play the game. And I started off with a 27 handicap at you know, junior golf clinics at Virginia Golf Club in the morning on Saturday mornings. And my first score was 108. And my handicap started tumbling, tumbling, tumbling. And believe it or not, in less than five years, uh, I won my first pro tournament. That's, so it's that's just, unbelievable. It was just a crazy ride. The fact that you only started at 16 and were pretty much learning on your own. And in I was self-taught, but I, had, I was cheating. I was cheating, <laughs> I was cheating in my... Uh, education because instead of having physics and chemistry on my desk when I was supposed to be studying at night time, I'd have underneath, because when my dad would walk in over my right shoulder and check, I'd pull out Golf My Way by Jack Nicholas. There you go. <laughs> you know? yeah. So I'd be studying, okay, Jack does it this way and yeah. this way and this way, so I'm gonna go practice that tomorrow. So I had copious notes written down about what my mission statement was to be tomorrow when I went to Virginia Golf Club to hit golf balls. And I was one of individual that I wouldn't take 20 different things. Mm -hmm. I'd take one, work on it. If it fit, put it in. If it didn't fit, quickly discard it. Mm -hmm. Because the secret to golf is to feeling as comfortable as you possibly can be in your own skin and in your own mind about, you know, 
being as most natural and most relaxed you can under pressure. The champion for 1986. So I just took one piece of information at a time, put it into my recipe of golf, a recipe of life, or a recipe of success, and, and just kept building it up and building it up.